do a close uh, of this meeting that really focused on different areas of convergence within our respective social movements uh, as a point of bringing all of them together to build one larger comprehensive human rights movement. So the building, the network building the movement focus was really trying to bring folks from a local level and an, a national level together to talk about how we can converge based upon the, the concrete areas that they're focusing on uh, in their work. Uh, and we have uh, uh, folks working in a, in a number of different areas, which you'll see. Uh, but let me give you what the order is. Uh, we have uh, Radhika Balakrishnan, who's uh, with the, the Center for Women's Global Leadership, uh, based out of Rutgers, New Jersey. She also happens to be uh, the board chair of the U.S. Human Rights Network. Uh, unfortunately, she'll be leaving us in that capacity uh, soon. So, you know, I wanted folks to give her a hand as our board chair before she leaves and the work that she's done. Uh, next, we have following uh, Radica, we're going to have Jamil Dakwa with the uh, ACLU. Uh, he's going to be talking, uh, well, I'll let Jamil talk about it, but really, a lot of the uh, state repression, the new forms of state repression communities being targeted throughout the country, particularly post 9-11, and what that means for all of us, because it's not just some particular communities that are being impacted, but really all of us. Uh, then we're going to close out uh, with Carlos Montes uh, with the Community to Stop FBI Repression, who's based here in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, um, if many of you don't know, uh, Carlos has been uh, a central figure in a lot of the social movements here in L.A. for a long, long time. Uh, as a kid growing up here, um, you, you learn a lot about, at least in the social circles that I was in, was fortunate to be, be brought up in, hearing about the Panthers, as you saw the 41st and Central uh, film that we showed the other day. But there was also the Brown Berets, there was the, the Chicano Moratorium, uh, August 29th movement. Is one of the people that was central to all those different movements. So he's going to close us out uh, with that piece. So I'm going to bring up Radica first. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, uh, before uh, giving my remarks, I want to take the prerogative of being the board chair to thank the staff for an amazing job at this conference. And so I would like uh, Candace and Amy and Laura uh, to stand up and take a bow for. And I also want to thank uh, Rachel and Kali, the co-directors of the U.S. Human Rights Network, for again, for an incredible job. Um, in the... In the time that uh, I have here, what I would like to speak about is um, some, a scary word called macroeconomic policy and why we as human rights activists and advocates and defenders need to look at economic policy and why that is an important part of our advocacy as we move forward. So to set the stage, um, I'm gonna show you a, a few uh, graphs partly because I'm an economist and that's what we do. But I think it's also important for us to see where we were and where we're going. So the uh, table that is up right now is um, a table of inequality data. And what it shows is in the, in, in the time between 1947 and 1979, the increase in real income by quintile. Okay, what does that mean? So in the last 30 years, the increase in real income for the bottom 20% in 1947 to 1979 went up by 118%, right? So the poorest 20%, their income went up by 118%. The second 20% went up by 100%, that's real income. Next 20%, 111, and we keep going up, and the top 5% went up by 86%. So in the time between 1947 and, and, and uh, 1979, everybody's real income went up, with the bottom 20%'s real income going up the most, and the top 5% going up as well, but 
proportionally the least, right? So those were the kind of economic policies that took place in that period of time. The next slide I'm gonna show you is what happened from 1979 on. So from, from 1979 to 2005, something happened. So the bottom 5% or the bottom 20%, their income went down by 1%, going up each quintile, right? The second 20% went up 9%. And then you look at the top 5% went up 81%. And that's the data till 2005, and if you look at it from 2005 to, to currently, that percentage actually even went further up. And the one number that I don't have a graph for here is that the top 1% went up the most, right? So this one looks at the top 5%. If we were to break up that 5% into just 1%, the 1%, you know, the, all the people in Occupy Wall Street are talking about the 1%. Well, that's the 1%. And that's what economic policy has been trying to do for the last 30 years. And so we as human rights activists and advocates need to start talking about what happened. What happened from 1947 to 1979? And what happened from 1979 till now? Something happened in economic policy. Um, but can we do the, I forgot what the next graph is. Go back. Okay, we'll leave the inequality. So a couple of things that I want to focus on. Uh, one is how do we then take human rights to talk about macroeconomic policy, right? Because economists often talk about economic policy as something real that experts do, and that human rights is some kind of aspirational goal, like some place we want to be, but what do we have to say about economics? And I think that we are living in a time that if we don't have someone talking about the reason for economic policy being the fulfillment of human rights, then we, we need to stop talking. Because obviously the economic policy that we've had for the last 30 years in particular have not fulfilled human rights. And so how do we use human rights as an ethical framework to assess economic policy? And we've, I've done a, a, a lot of work which is available on the website of the Human Rights Network and other places, but I'll give you a couple of examples of where we can use human rights norms to talk about economic policy. One is is the obligation to protect. And this obligation that comes from the Maastricht Guidelines says that the government has an obligation to protect people living in that country against third party, third party abuses. And it's often used as sort of um, protecting people against violation by employers. But I think that we need to use the argument of the obligation to protect in terms of the regulatory changes that took place that caused the financial crisis. And so when we talk about, you know, the financial crisis and all the banks that failed and the TARP and all of that, we, that it was a deliberate act, right? I mean, the crisis, when people talk about the crisis, they act as though, I don't know, the skies opened up and then there was a crisis and the banks failed. Uh, and that there was not some very deliberate policy measures that took place that, that what, what we've been calling the manufactured crisis. And so by looking at the regulatory changes that took place, place, especially the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act and, and under Clinton and Larry Summers, that is what caused this crisis. And so how do we use human rights norms to talk about that kind of regulatory processes? You know, it's, they always talk about deregulation and regulation. I would say there's no such thing as deregulation. It's just biased regulation. It's regulation that's in the interest of some and not in the interest of workers and, and families and communities. So one is the idea of the uh, of the um, obligation to protect. The second thing I want to talk about um, is this idea that government spending. I mean, there's so much debate right now in terms of deficit spending and debt, and both the Republicans and Democrats have taken on this, we have to cut spending, we have to cut spending. And I would say that we need to change the discourse as to what government spending actually is. And so I, I title this, this as that the government is not a household. 
When people talk about the government spending too much money, they say, well, if you don't have any money, would you go buy a car? Right, that's the example. And of course, all of us would say, well, if you don't have any money, maybe you shouldn't buy a car. But the government is not a household. When the government spends money, it actually creates employment. And when it creates employment, it creates revenue. When it creates revenue, it gets to spend more money. And so this idea that we can't spend money because the government is a household and why would you spend more money than you have is a problem in terms of the way it's being articulated. And it seems to have caught on to people's imagination that, yeah, we shouldn't spend money. We need to cut spending. We need to cut spending. And we can't increase revenue because that's, so, you know, rich people, you can't, they'll go somewhere. I don't know where they're going to go. I, between 19, 1947 and 1979, they didn't go anywhere. They were here, right? So suddenly they're going to go somewhere and I'm not sure where they're going to go. <laughs> so let's increase those taxes and start spending money because spending money is what's going to generate jobs, it's going to generate revenue, and it's going to provide for economic and social rights which are being cut drastically by the minute. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, which is people uh, don't usually talk about uh, monetary policy and, and, the fa and uh, human rights, but this is a number I want all of you to not forget when you leave here, because this is not a number that is in our newspapers. There's a certain amount of money that commercial banks keep at the Federal Reserve. That requirement that the reserves that that banks have been holding in the Federal Reserve have been somewhere around 29 billion uh, in the in the 1990s uh, it, it went to the lowest level in 2007 it was about 19 billion dollars is how much that people held on to the banks look what happens from 2007 so the reserve the, the, that line is what it's been like for the last 10 years Suddenly, that amount of money that commercial banks are holding in the Federal Reserve is now $1.6 trillion. $1.6 trillion is sitting in the Federal Reserve held by commercial banks who are not loaning money out. And so when we talk about the fact that there's no money out there and we have to cut spending and we have to do all of this, the Federal Reserve has what they call a quantitative easing. They've handed over this money to commercial banks with no restrictions on whether they should spend it. And so one of the things that I would argue, as, we, as, as Kali said, this is a move forward, is that all of us human rights activists and advocates need to call the, mon the Federal Reserve on not spending money. They need to make these banks spend their money. I don't know if anyone's recently tried to get a mortgage. It's impossible. Uh, they don't let you do it. And so, the and, and while they're holding on to $1.6 trillion, not doing their job, they're getting bonuses because they say that they're doing their job. So in terms of moving forward, my plea is let's take on the macroeconomic policy of this country. Thank you. Okay, next I want to bring up uh, Eric Mann, uh, who's based here in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he's the, the founder of the uh, Labor Community Strategy Center, uh, which some of you, if you were in the, in the workshop earlier today, have talked to, you know, heard about some of the dynamic work that they're doing. The Flagstaff, uh, if you will, is the, the Bus Riders Union, which has had a national impact. I know uh, some of the folks who are in the network, particularly the, what used to be Atlanta Jobs with Justice, uh, also started a Bus Riders Union. Uh, some years ago that they're working out of, but the model and the precedent around that and fighting for the transformation of, of uh, public transportation into a human right is some of the innovative work that they're doing, just to give you an example of. Eric is also uh, a very prolific writer, and I know we've used a lot of his stuff over the course of some time uh, in many study groups, and he's got a, a, a new piece that he just put out that we're trying to do some uh, uh, study group stuff with, I know, a couple of folks out of the Occupy movement in Atlanta, actually. So just to give you a little sense of who he is, I'm going to bring Eric up. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. Uh, um, you know, the uh, just like Kyle was saying, 
uh, we like to come up with what we call counter hegemonic demand development and ideas to challenge other people's minds. So. Uh, we're the Bus Riders Union, and this is our fight. Mass transportation is a human right. We want 50 cent fare and $20 passes, because mass transportation belongs to the masses. Yeah. So, <laughs> and that was Barbara Lott Holland, the co-chair of the Bus Riders Union in the back, my partner. And I think what Kyle was saying is right, is that it was really good that you said that they've tried to raise the concept of transportation as a human right. I think we know that uh, the concept of human rights and its interaction with civil rights has gone on pretty much as long as we know, but certainly Malcolm X perhaps was the person who raised it to the highest level of theory and who talked about the concept that I'd like to say we believe in civil rights and human rights because we certainly don't want to give up our civil rights inside the laws of the United States, but we don't want the laws of the United States to be the, the sole determinant of what people can demand inside this country. Um, I think if we look at like the 99% movement, it's done some really great things. But one of the things I think it needs to improve upon is it's really talk inside the boundaries of the United States. It talked about the 1% versus sort of the 99%. But when I was at Occupy LA, I talked to people and I said, well, look, uh, um, and there's Quasi Infuma there back there. And Krumus has been helping me, and he's also played a tremendous role in Occupy LA, and he and I were talking about it, is when we talk about ending the war, in Afghanistan and ending the war in Iraq, I think we know that there is no U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, that the, uh, the United States Embassy in Iraq is larger than some cities. It's a permanent base of occupation. There's 100,000 mercenaries still in Iraq. And what I learned is that, to show you how they constantly try to get around the rules, the State Department, for the first time ever, has developed its own troops. So now there's this concept where there are 6,000 armed members of the State Department in Iraq. So as fast as we try to restrict how our government operates, they constantly uh, reconfigure the debate. We have to talk about, and again, talking to the people at Occupy LA, that there's 14 million immigrants in this country, all of whom deserve um, amnesty and the option of citizenship. It's very interesting because I think what I want to talk about today is the question of framing the terms of the debate. Why Malcolm was so important on the issue of human rights, not just civil rights. Um, if you look at most of the immigrant rights groups today, they're very stuck in this concept of comprehensive immigration reform. And first of all, that has no moral value. I mean, how can you organize people? Hey, I'd like to talk to you, go door to door. Are you interested in comprehensive immigration reform? Who even knows what it is, let alone wants to fight for it? So it's interesting to watch the way people get stuck inside the arguments of the government because comprehensive immigration reform means, first of all, a border that's militarized and then, theoretically, some road to citizenship plus uh, uh, registration plus admitting criminal, being criminal. So this is a horrible idea, and whatever happened to the idea of amnesty? So the word amnesty has almost been thrown out of the debate, and we have to bring it back into the debate as the main argument that I think we want to make, which is no human being is illegal, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. All the things that we've done in the civil rights and human rights mo movement to change the terms of the debate. If we argue on the other side's argument, we can never win. The Strategy Center developed this idea of fight transit racism. Now, you may think, God, in the 60s, that would have been so modest. But in the 90s, you have no idea how shaken up people were by the concept of fight transit racism. Why? Because at the time we sued the Los Angeles MTA, the CEO, Franklin White, was African American. The, uh, on the board was Gloria Molina, the first Latina to get elected to the county supervisors. Richard Alatore, a, a Latino civil right, um, not civil, a, a Latino city councilman. And so 
we were already stuck in the world of post-racialism, which is, this is no time to talk about racism. And a lot of white people gave me advice, like gave the Strategy Center advice, why do you need to talk about fight transit racism? Why don't you just talk about better bus service for everybody? Well, we want better bus service for everybody, but fight transit racism is a way to articulate that 94% of the bus riders are people of color, is phenomenally racist for people to be late to work, stuck on a bus with 40 people sitting and 40 people standing. So again, the argument is, even when I was negotiating with the head of the MTA, and he was about to give us a thousand new buses through our civil rights suit, he said, would it be possible to stop talking about racism? And I realized that that was very important to him in terms of one of the things that we had raised is he was trying to, he was giving us a thousand buses and all he wanted us to do is stop talking about racism. And, what I, and the other thing he says, would you stop sitting in all the time? So I realized, well, when your opponent tells you the two things he wants you to get rid of is stop talking about racism and stop sitting in, I went, okay, those are two great things we're doing, right? So no, I'm not giving you that, of course. In fact, we'll do it more. Now, um, today we're in a very difficult situation. Speaking for myself, I was a militant advocate for the election of Barack Obama to, pr to be president. And um, we could have that debate, uh, but any good speakers trying to raise the terms of debate. I thought it was very important, and still do, to elect the first African-American president. I thought it was on a united front against the right to defeat McCain, Bush, Cheney, all those folks. I think we've seen the phenomenal disaster of the Obama presidency and some really frightening things that have been brought to bear under his aegis. But what I think was also important, saying things, is that that broad coalition that elected Obama, in my opinion, was number one, anti-racist, number two, thought it was in the United Front against the right, thought this was an anti-war president, thought that they were gonna fight for Wall, uh, Main Street against Wall Street, and what's important about that is not how much people were fooled, but how much people who worked for him thought that that's what they were fighting for, indicating that we had a coalition that we wanted to be part of. Now, I think what's happening now in the country is, is very dangerous, and I want to talk about the optimism. Um, the Occupy people have done a really brilliant thing, which we keep talking about them, but they have changed the terms of the debate. By raising the 1% against the 99%, in some way they've confused the issue because, well, up at the 97%, 96%, 95%, 94%, there are people of enormous wealth and power. But what they've raised as a concept is that there's a ruling class in this country, because the 1% is not just based on wealth, it's based on power. And what they've argued is you can be very, very rich in this country, but you still don't have power. And that there is a class structure to the United States. A guy named Professor Lakoff, I don't know, anybody heard of him, George Lakoff? Yeah. Hey? Well, he's been doing a lot of work around the so-called shifting the terms of the debate. And to share with you something that's just some new thoughts in my head, I don't agree with him. Because I just read an article that he wrote giving advice to the movement about how to shift the terms of the debate. And one of the things he said in this recent article is, you have to stop talking about capitalism. I mean that. He said, because capitalism gets people thinking about socialism. I mean, this is word for word. This is word for word. And I know, that's what I'm saying, brother. And no, this is his argument. And socialism gets people to think about what? Communism. So we don't want to, so check this out. We don't want to talk about capitalism because it might lead us to talk about socialism, which might lead us to talk about communism. So you know what you propose? propose? Instead, the market must work for all of us. That's his radical concept of shifting the terms of the debate. Well, first of all, a market is inherently in capable of working for all of us. A market by its very nature is not just amoral, but immoral. Because a market said, that what the market will bear is what we can pay for. As a result, the slave becomes a commodity in a market system. 
an undocumented worker is a commodity in a market system. How in the world is the undocumented worker ever going to have enough capital to operate in a market system to take on Goldman Sachs. It's such a fraud about a market for all of us to make the system inclusive just at the time when Occupy uh, America, Occupy Wall Street has finally said there is no market for all of us. The market is by itself dominated by the capitalist, yes, the capitalist, who might lead us to think about socialism because Instead of thinking about an instant move to socialism and debating all the debates about socialism, it's important to understand that if we regulate corporations, they call it socialism, and I would say no, but I think it's a step in the right direction rather than being ashamed of it. If, in fact, we have guaranteed income for everybody, that's not socialism, but certainly that's a move in the direction of socialism against free market capitalism. If we get out of Afghanistan, if we in fact cut the military budget by 50% from 700 billion to 350 billion, is that socialism? No. But is that a movement in the direction of a socialist society as opposed to a warfare society? Yes, it is. So one of the things I've been realizing about this is just like when the head of the MTA told me not to talk about racism, I haven't been talking about socialism in a long time until George Lakoff told me not to. And as soon as he told me not to in his article, I realized, you know what? I have not been talking about socialism enough. I mean that. And I'm going to start talking about it more. So um, thanks a lot for having me. Um, the last thing is uh, every author. I've written a new book called Playbook for Progressives, 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer. I would love you all to have a copy. I have 18 copies here. They're $15 each. All the money goes to the Strategy Center. But there's a fun what I did was I took the qualities of successful organizers and I raised it to a theory. And then I tried to figure out who would be a great character in my movie. So the first quality, the first job description of the organizer is called the foot soldier. Wakes up in the morning, goes out on the street, goes out on the block, goes out on the bus. And who did I pick? But Saudi Muhammad, because he is one of the great foot soldiers of our generation. It tells the story about the initiation of black workers for justice, about the Kmart struggle, about the incredible work he did, I don't know if you know, being a janitor on the night shift and using that job to get into um, five different black factories we organized, you know, in terms of strategic um, situation. Anybody see the, the film, remember the film, The Spook Who Sat By The Door? Yeah. Yeah. And you remember one of their tricks, he said, a black man with a mop and pail can get in anywhere? And that's how he got into the White House? So, so this is a great book. I urge you to get a copy of it. I'm honored to be part of this. I'm honored to be Carlos Montes, who's fought so hard for us. And thanks a lot for having me. All right, next I want to bring up Jamil. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am um, speaking about uh, books. Uh, I don't have my own book, uh, but I want to make uh, promote uh, Radhika's book. She, she forgot to tell you about her book, Good. Economic Policy and Human Rights. You can get even 20% 20, 20 uh, discount if you have that voucher. Good. Uh, but I'm really honored and thank you uh, for the U.S. Human Rights Network uh, for uh, inviting us to, uh, to be part of this panel. Uh, we feel very honored to be with the, with the speakers and the, and the seasoned advocates and, and human rights advocates in, 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 in this part of, uh, of the country. And also, I want to thank uh, the staff uh, of the network and particularly the co-directors for, for their hard work over the transitional period. I think that uh, uh, we all uh, wish the network and we continue to, to support the network in the next phase with the new uh, leader coming in. I also want to recognize my colleague uh, Chandra Bhatnagar and his leadership on a lot of the, this work, um, uh, particularly was one of the, uh, the founders of the, of the people who were uh, in the first, very first group that convened in Howard and kind of <coughs> talked about uh, human rights in the United States and, and building the movement. So uh, thank you, Chandra, for all this work. 
what I want to talk about uh, and use my uh, 10 minutes or so is to really think about the where we are right now with uh, with the situation of human rights in this country. And I think I want to use some of the terminology that's often used to talk about the economic situation. But I want to really try to connect things that, again, things that we discussed over the past two years and how we really can uh, build uh, the movement that have uh, real accountability for human rights. And I think the real serious crisis is that there is accountability deficit uh, in the country, and particularly in the area of human rights. And, and, and that is uh, a kind of a, a, a theme that, that you see it uh, almost everywhere uh, in, in this country. Uh, the economic uh, crisis and the meltdown. Can you please speak into the microphone more? I will. The economic meltdown uh, and the, the banking system and the way that uh, people who were responsible for, for, the, for uh, the, the breakdown in the, uh, in the economic uh, situation, particularly people's uh, lives being ruined, people losing their homes, people losing their jobs, and yet we have not seen real accountability on Wall Street. And I think that is what uh, the Occupy movement is doing. It is an ac accountability movement in the first place. But it is also a huge deficit in accountability for human rights in the, in the things that we've seen since 9-11 and post 9-11 policies, which have created a monstrous uh, system and regime of oppression inside the United States domestically and internationally, uh, built on things that have been, uh, have started in the past. It's not uh, it's only like 9-11 that turned. It was a turning point in the sense that it has become almost uh, um, um, a celebrity thing to, to claim that, yes, people can be tortured and waterboarded with no accountability. And you have former leaders of this country write memoirs, go on talk shows, brag about their responsibility for torture. And that Essentially, one of the things that, uh, as an organization, as the ACLU, we've been from day one uh, with other groups like CCR and other uh, important organizations, been trying very hard to, to not to, to lose sight of what's been happening since 9-11, and particularly not to lose sight of the fact that not a single person has been held in the leadership military and civilian leadership of the country, not a single individual has been held accountable for crimes, war crimes, the crime of torture, disappearance, secret detention facilities, and, and some of the, these policies, unfortunately, not only that they were not uh, stopped when Obama took office, but some of them, unfortunately, con were continued and expanded. The targeted killings program is one of those programs. Well, you know, you, we, we no longer can hold people in secret detention overseas. We can't torture people according to, to the executive order that Obama signed on the, his next second day in office. But we can kill people even if they are not on the battlefield, right. even if they are walking around. And we're not really sure whether they had uh, any relationship to, uh, to taking a direct participation, what we call in the legal jargon, uh, be, uh, taking direct part in hostilities against the United States on the battlefield. So all of a sudden, you create this notion that the war is everywhere. Uh, it could be. Here, in your even, even according to Congress in the past couple of weeks, for people who are following that, even here in the United States, the military can detain American citizens uh, without charge indefinitely. Uh, and that is something that has been built up through the post-9-11 regime, and yet no accountability for even that. The other thing I want to touch on is the issue of uh, how do you really, how is it possible for a democracy to be sustainable um, without real accountability for human rights. It has to be either fake democracy or unsustainable democracy if you don't have real accountability for human rights. And that is something that really uh, the US government has uh, for many, many years created this illusion that US is in fact the ultimate uh, uh, leader on human rights, 
and uh, especially in the minds of people around the world. Uh, and I think that 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 image, where this is our greater challenge. Yes, the United States government is championing some human rights issues, no doubt about that. And we will we will recognize some of those uh, issues. But at the same time, it had created exceptions and had neglected and ignored to embrace certain human rights and completely abandoned uh, the, the promise that was made, at least the promise that was uh, rhetorically and, and was uh, made in, in before the United Nations in 1945, when uh, we're here in San Francisco, uh, we had 50 governments coming together uh, to build the United Nations, among other things, in order to promote and protect human rights. And that led to the creation of this notion that you can create exceptions. We've seen that uh, in the different policies, whether you take people to Guantanamo and say the Geneva Conventions are not applicable, whether you take people and put them in prison and you say, we demonize them and you say, well, you can, they can be locked up 23 hours a day um, and be subject to solitary confinement. You can do that in the context of immigration where you treat people as legal uh, human beings and no one cares what really happens. You can do that in a multiple ways and we see that and obviously there's a long history of that. Not seeing the indigenous communities and their um, uh, uh, connection to this place before anyone even thought about this place. The notion that you really can take people and tell them it, either you are um, you are outside uh, the, the concept of human humanity at all. Strip them of their humanity. And some people believe that if you're a citizen, you're better off. But the truth is, if you're a citizen, you're not really better off. Depending on what group you belong to, what are the political circumstances you're under? And the Muslim Americans after 9-11 realized that, African Americans realized a long time ago, other communities have no, learned these lessons for years, and yet we see that come back again and again. The role of the network must continue in terms of uh, building the movement, uh, public education around human rights, connecting the different organizations and, and, and uh, whether it's a community-based organization, which is a level of advocacy organizations, or just building a movement for human rights. But at the same time, it has the role of identifying those strategic opportunities to expand the notion of accountability for human rights. We've discussed some of those uh, ideas over the past couple of days. And there are some good ideas, the staff of the network, the people who worked really hard on presenting them to us. And I think what we really want to do, we, we have to be prepared for starting uh, a real conversation about human rights in this country and take advantage of every resource, everything that is available to our means in order to make sure that there is a, a leadership uh, in the communities and in the different organizations that people will come up with some sort of an I have a human rights dream. Thank you. All right, to close us out, uh, we, will, we will do a little uh, question and answer before our kind of final close. So if folks can, if you got some things that you want to address to any of the speakers, think about it, write it out. I would encourage you to do that, but we're going to close out with Carlos. Right. Thank you very much. I'm the closer, huh? I told let me go let me go last so I could <laughs> see what everybody else is gonna say and I could contribute what I have, right? Well, you know, there's a lot for me to talk about, you know, and usually what before I talk to a group I like to know who's in the audience, get to know the audience, what's up, you know, where you're from, so you any Chicanos in the house, first of all? Let me, let's see, come on, come on, we got one. No Chicanos in the house, or nobody wants to admit it. You know, any Latinos in the house? Any Latinos? You know, a couple, all right. Okay, any Colombianos, Cubanos? <laughs> so, uh, you know, my name is Carlos Montes. Uh, just, to, you know, uh, my parents brought me from Mexico as a little kid, so I grew up in South L.A. and East L.A., right? And um, let me do a shout-out here. Uh, when the people are under attack, 
What do we do? Stand up. Right. When the people are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. Right. And Bilal and he's fighting back, taking over the old ramparts uh, uh, police station. Right. I think what I have to say about the, uh, just in terms of introduction, is the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement. I've been to Occupy Wall Street. You know, I marched from uh, downtown to uptown in a, in a march, and also Occupy LA. That it's not only, uh, you know, to use some of the words that change the debate, I like to say it's really put the Pandora's box. They opened up the Pandora's box for the U.S. economic crisis, right? That even young, uh, student white folks are talking about the economic crisis and capitalism, right? But what I think it's also done, it's it put out the 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 uh, the challenge that it's not about about regulating capitalism or taxing the rich. I had one young white guy with a master's degree in economics told, was telling me about regulating or taxing the rich so we could lower the deficit, blah blah blah. And I said, you know, let's start talking about something different. Why do we have to have rich people? I said, why does it have to be a class society? I told him, why don't we, instead of taxing the rich, let me throw something out, since this is like General Assembly time, why don't we just ax the rich? <laughs> you know what I mean? I said, well, you know, let's talk about that. And I, I, think, I think what the Occupy movement has done is, is really uh, centered at the fact that we have super rich, you know, monopoly capitalists, you know, I'm from the 60s, these are the monopoly capitalists that control the wealth of this country that go around and plunder the whole world. So we've got to challenge and put them on check that it's not about regulating. We can't regulate this crisis. We can't regulate capitalism. We got to get rid of it. Okay? You know, I mean, any of you, any of you with me on that? Right? So the, so the question is, you know, about building the move, how do we do that? And all many of you have been trying to do it, or we've been doing it for many years, right? I, I see a lot of faces out there that I haven't seen. You know, wave at me, I haven't seen you since the 60s, 70s, quite some of you see you last week. How do we do that? So the question is, how do we do that? How do we build a movement? And and who do we unite with? You know, because Tani told me about talking about building unity, talking about building the movement. And I think we build the movement by uniting with folks who are in struggle. And I want to give you a couple of examples in my upbringing. I learned about building the movement and uniting when Bunchy Carter and John Huggins came from South LA to East LA to the Bombay office and talked to us about building black and brown unity, the Black Panthers and the Bombays. And even though there were some Bombays who had that racism, who had grown up in the East LA ghetto, and never work with blacks, were against it. And when we went to South LA to the Black Panther Party to work with them, there were some blacks, what are them essays doing here? And you know, how many, and just to, just for the record, how many of you know who Bunchy Carter John Hung is this? And those of you who don't know, you know, I wanted to share, you know, of course they were assassinated, but you know, it taught me the, 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 the important issue of, of building unity. Not only a racist, but among poor working class youth, right? Another example I want to turn out, that the building movement, building unity, when Harry Haywood in the 80s asked to have Carlos Montes speak in Watts about the struggle for self-determination of Chicanos, because he was going to talk about self-determination for blacks. <coughs> and I go, I don't know who he, who is he? I read up about shit, I, yeah, I'll go and speak in Watts, right? And, and um, so building the unity for the struggle for self-determination of blacks. So Harry, how many of you know who Harry Haywood is? Raise your hand. Okay. That's good. That's good. You know, that's good. I mean, you know, and this is our history. A black revolutionary leader hero in the United States that, of course, is not in the U.S. history books. Another, another example, back in 68 when MLK organized the Poor People's Campaign, the original Rainbow Coalition, mm -hmm. and we were invited to go on there. Abernathy, Jose Williams, and Jesse said, don't invite those militant Mexicans. <laughs> you know, the Brown Berets, the Crusade for Justice, the Alianza Federal de Mercedes. But MLK saw the need for building unity, building movement. That if it really had to be a rainbow coalition, you have to have those militant Mexicans. But we didn't believe in peaceful nonviolence, and we told them straight out. We believe in self-defense, we'll go 
And we were there in Poor People's Campaign for two or three months, you know, protesting. Of course, by then, MLK had been assassinated. And, you know, that experience taught me the, 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 the importance of building unity with blacks, whites, Puerto Ricans, poor working class folks for social change. But it also taught me a few lessons about, you know, learning who are your enemies and who are, who are your friends, right? And when we marched one time, you know, I could, I could talk about Jesse now, I think, right? You know, I mean, Jesse's cool. I supported him in the Latinos for Jackson in 84, 88. But um, when we marched on the, on the Attorney General's office demanding, uh, what do we demand? You know, hands off the, the Chicano activists that had been busted, right? And we, we, we wanted to sit in at the Attorney General's office, and Ramsey Clark was there. We got to demand, let the Chicanos, you know, because we were being indicted for the walkouts and the more they have you. And Jesse came over, and yeah, we started pumping everything up, and, you know, and, and he supported us. But then he said, no, nah, we're not going to sit in. We're going to go back to Resurrection City. <laughs> you know, and I said, hey, wait a minute, Jesse, we're sitting in here. Because oh, before that, we had been doing sit-ins at the, at the uh, Health Education Welfare Department. Anyway, it taught me that, you know, within the Chicano movement, the black movement, we have classes, yeah. right? Poor working folks, you know, m you know, upper class, petty bourgeois folks, bourgeois folks, you know? And, and most generally, we're all progressive. You know, we got Antonio over here, you know, Chicano socialist, right? But we gotta understand that the movement has to be led by poor working people, right? And uh, we are in the class, right? All right, all right, just hear it for that. Poor working people, which you are, you work with, and you organize, right? And, uh, <clears throat> So I, I think the other theme in terms of human rights, the U.S. is the biggest violator in the world of human rights. Straight out. All this bullshit about Cuba and Libya and everywhere else, it's a bunch of bullshit. They've killed more people, bombed more people than anybody in the history of the human race. Absolutely. Right? And, we just, and, and, and I've traveled to Colombia and I've traveled to Cuba and Mexico, right? So we're in the middle of a class war, and the repression that is being unleashed right now is primarily against the oppressed nationalities, which is blacks. Killing you, killing us, jailing us, and Mexicans and Central Americans. The immigration attack, can I ask for more minutes? A couple of more minutes? <laughs> Give me more minutes, okay. <laughs> and, and, <clears throat> is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Come on, more. Hey, 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 I'm getting warmed up here, okay. <laughs> so, so you know, we're in the middle of a class war against all working people, right? And the U.S. is in a war against the people of the world, right? But particularly in the U.S., unless we acknowledge that blacks and black and brown people are facing the brunt of this attack. All we gotta look is the immigration situation, and you all know about it, especially with the so-called Polymigra ESCOM, right? And by the way, the other part about building the unity and building the movement is having you all come out yesterday to march with us, to jam Obama and Baca. Yeah, you all, how many of you were there? I know you were all busy there, you cannot go, you're right. Like in the middle of your conference, you got on a bus, went over there, Marty came back, and that was great. So thank you for being there and jamming Baca. So what Secure Community, so-called ESCOM, is doing is detaining and deporting thousands of working class, poor working class, uh, primarily Mexicano, Central America. If you look at the numbers, 90% of the deportation, the Latino, and of those, 80% are Mexican. So we're facing an extreme of national oppression. It's national oppression, it ain't discriminate. It's the oppression of a people, right? And that's why we call it, you know, I say, I came up with a new term now, Obaca. <laughs> Obama, you know, Obama, escucha, estamos en la lucha there in Baca, that sellout fool, the sheriff of LA County, is an advocate of so-called secure community, we call his ass on it. We're gonna be marching at another speech next week, so thank you for coming yesterday, right? There was a f second time. We know since 9-11, the FBI and the federal rep repressive apparatus has been attacking Palestinians, Arab, and Muslim, and jailing them for the last 10 years, right? And now they're coming after the Mexicans and the blacks, but especially they're coming after anti-war activists, and solidarity activists who have gone to Africa, to Asia, to Colombia, to Iraq, to Palestine. My homeboy, Hotham, and my homegirl, Anne, 
went to Palestine in jail and interviewed the Palestinian prisoners and wrote about it in the newspaper, Fight Back. And you got a stack of Fight Backs, right? The Fight Back News online. And we put it on there. Jess Sundin, 10 years ago, went to the mountains of Colombia and visited with the FARC. How many of you know who the FARC is? <laughs> Fuerzas Armadas Reusonales de Colombia. Now this is when the FARC was in peace negotiations with the Pastrana, Pastrana regime. Before the US State Department put them on the terrorist list. And by the way, I'm on that list now. I mean, you know. Now, you know yeah, you're right. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> so my point here is that working class activists, anti-war activists, are being attacked by the FBI. Accusing, including myself, of course, and, and, and the, if you look at the warrant that they used at the anti-war committee in Minnesota, they put in their uh, investigation for, for providing material support to the PFLP and the FARC. How many of you know who the PFLP is? The PFLP. Come on, come on, man. Tell, tell them what it is. Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Right, right. Now, 95% of the probably the Palestinian groups fighting for human rights are probably on the so-called terrorist list, which is bullshit, right? So let me, let me kind of wrap it up here in my point, is that this state repression against working people and, and against the world. I don't have to give you the examples of Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Plan Merida in Mexico. The millions of dollars that are given to the, the, the Mexican government, to the army to kill its own people. I can't even go back to my hometown Juarez, where I was raised, because of the assassinations of human rights activists. And when I was in Colombia, I met with human rights activists, Afro-Colombianos, who have been displaced from their land, campesinos who fought for their land, who are being kidnapped and assassinated, labor organizers from coal industry, Coca-Cola, the oil industry, who are killed and assassinated. Some of them are here now, United Steel Workers. I love them because they bring them here and help them survive. When I came back to the US, when we came back from Palestine, we denounced human rights violations. We talked about it in everywhere we could. You know, uh, when I talk about we, I'm talking about the Columbia Action Network, Palestine Solidarity Group, Freedom Road Socialist Organization, Fight Back News, and all of our members and activists are union rank and file members. They're gay activists. They're anti-war activists. We are janitors. We're in SEIU. We're in the team just for democratic society. We are rank and file fighters. And we take this message of US, that denounce US imperialism in Palestine and Colombia to the working class, right? Are you with me on that? Yes. yes. And that's why they're attacking us. Because we led the big ass march at the Republican Convention 2001, we denounced the warmongers, right? Bush McCain, we had war with them on the street till they finally put out the snow, the snow plows on us, all right? And, and, and arrested us and dispersed us. And it infiltrated, the FBI infiltrated the anti-war committee in Minnesota. They infiltrated us for two years investigating us to see if we're providing material support for terrorist organizations, which we're not. We ain't stupid to do that, to give them arms and money. We do solidarity work. Solidarity is not a crime. So we fight here and organize the struggle here at home, but we express solidarity. I learned that in East LA in a high school where they try to recruit me to join the army. That the Vietnamese people are not our enemy. And I learned not only from the Black Liberation Movement and, and the Vietnamese people, that it's a struggle for liberation. And we need to fight here at home and support the liberation struggles abroad. And right now the struggle is in Palestine, in Colombia, in Mexico. And by expressing solidarity, a federal grand jury out of Chicago is investigating us for being so-called providing material support, which is the total bullshit. So we're under attack. I'm under attack. 23 of the activists were, were, were raided at their homes. They took their computers, no. their cell phones, their iPads, all the documents. Joe, Joe and Stephanie, home there, the FBI was in their house for over eight hours, taking tons of documents. Stephanie is a fighter for Puerto Rican rights in the Valles of Chicago. Joe is a rank and file ACIU member. They're under attack. 
They're being investigated for providing material support to terrorist organizations. I was raided at my house May the 17th of this year. They busted the door down. 15, they, the cops said 15 to 20 SWAT team sheriffs of the anti-terrorist unit of the sheriffs with the FBI. Busted the door down at 5 o'clock in the morning. Arrested my ass, you know, of course. I had guns. Hell yeah, I had guns. I believe really self-defense. But, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I had a gun by my bed, a loaded Beretta 9mm. You know, it was registered legal. I have, I have registered legal gun that I bought over the years. What, I, what would have happened if I had picked it up? Right? You know, I, I heard, bam, they broke the door down. I said, what the hell is it, the cops? You know, I get up, I go, fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, you know. As an activist, you know, you always have in the back of the mind, and one day they're going to come for our ass, right? You know, like Gil Scott Heron said, what did he say? Wake up, Valley. Valley, come on, man. Don't sleep with my thing. I need to get there. But you were coming. He said, no knock. That no knock. Like, they ain't going to knock. They didn't knock on my door. They busted it down, right? If I had even gone for my cell phone or my wallet, I would have been dead. They kill people in the street just for going for their cell phone. They do it every, every day. Not every month. Blacks and Chicanos are killed. So let me kind of wrap it up. I'm sorry I went too long, but, but you know, we're under attack. So I'm here to ask for your support, not just of me or the movement of the, of the, of the Chicanos, Mexicanos, African Americans that are under attack. You're doing great work. You're organizing. You know, I don't know all, all that you do, but there, 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 I have a flyer right there in the back. This one, bilingual flyer, stopfbi.net. You can sign the petition. You could do a letter of solidarity from your organization. Many of you have already had. We have uh, a whole resolution from the uh, Illinois State Council of SEIU that did a resolution. We have ASME. We have the Chicago Teachers Union, the UTLA here, and the California Faculty Association are doing resolution. I'll need your support because if they get us, they're going to come after your ass. I mean, the 60s, they called us troublemakers, drug addicts, hippies, communists. Now they're calling us terrorists. We're not terrorists. We're in solidarity with the people of the world that this government is killing and oppressing. And it's okay to say imperialism. Yeah. Don't say globalization or neoliberal, blah, blah, blah. It's U.S. imperialism. 